YouTube, it's Tom, back with another one for you. So this one, you're gonna like, it is, uh, it's called the Affidavit of Walker Todd. And so this is a banker that at one point ended up in a court situation to where he went and uh, devolved, I mean, you know, if this shit is even true, regardless of the fact that, you know, these people, they, you know, there's rules to this whole game. They, they literally have to tell you what they're doing and they'll do it in some shit like this and then they'll bury it, you know what I mean? So, so, you know, so we're going to talk about this shit today. Basically, this is a affidavit of a banker that went to court, had some type of situation and ended up divulging the fact that, uh, I mean, not that it was a secret, but that, uh, you know, fiat currency just is what it is backed by nothing and it's just credit. And then what, you know, that gold and silver is actually lawful money and things, uh, things of that nature. So you have legal tenure, then you have lawful money. So let's get into this. So here you have the beginning of the case, uh, bank one, this is who he was dealing with, right? So, and then we'll get into the affidavit. So it says, uh, now comes the affiant, Walker F. Todd, a citizen of the United States and the state of Ohio over the age of 21 and declares as follows under penalty of perjury. So he literally put his, uh, put his freedom on the line to attest to the fact that what he's about to say in this particular document is 100% facts and he's willing to stand on that with his life. Okay, so that, you know, I take that as pretty, uh, as pretty serious. On top of the fact that, that this shit just is what it is. So that, I am familiar with the promissory note and, disper and disbursement request and authorization date, dated November 23, 1999. Together, sometimes referred to in other documents filed by defendants in this case as the alleged agreement between defendant and plaintiff, but called the note in this affidavit, uh, so the agreement is going to be called a note, right? There's going to be a promissory note that you sign when you agree to pay for anything and then they go ahead and sell that off. But that's the one thing that they always need to even send you a fucking bill. So that, so that's where they really fuck up is when you end up in court and they're asking you questions and shit, just ask them for the original wedding signed promissory note that you signed with them because they do need that to even have sent you a bill. Otherwise, all the bills that they've sent you prior is fucking mail fraud. So... If called as a witness, I would testify as stated herein. I make this affidavit based on my own personal knowledge of the legal, economic, and historical principles stated herein, except that I have relied entirely on documents provided to me, including the note, regarding certain facts at issue in this case, of which I previously had no direct and or personal knowledge, I am making this affidavit based on my experience and expertise as an attorney, economist, research writer, and teacher. I am competent to make the following statements. So then after this, he, go, he goes ahead and uh, proceeds to basically break down how the monetary system works. So let's get into this shit real quick. So right here, you have professional background qualifications. I mean, really what, I mean, to be honest with you, what 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 makes you a qualified banker? The fact that you deal with primary receiver notes every day that you call Federal Reserve notes, that automatically puts you in the, in, in the position of being recognized as a fucking banker because you deal with securities, okay? So regardless of the fact, professional background shit, I mean, everybody here is a private banker because you deal with Federal Reserve notes unless you deal uh, only with gold. So then there it is. So two, my qualifications as an expert witness in monetary and banking instruments are as follows. For 20 years, I worked as an attorney and legal officer for the legal departments of the Federal Reserve Banks of New York and Cleveland. Uh, among other things, I was assigned responsibility for questions involving both novel, which is new, and routine bank notes, bonds, bankers' acceptances, securities, and other financial instruments in connection with my work for the Federal Reserve Banks. Discount windows and parts of the open market trading desk function in New York. Uh, in addition, for nine years, I worked as an economist researcher officer as the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. I became one of the Federal Reserve System's recognized experts on the legal history uh, of central banking and the pledging of notes, bonds, and other financial instruments at the discount window to enable the Federal Reserve to make advances of credit that be uh, that became or could become money. Now, I mean, I mean, literally, you can monetize anything. I mean, it's, if it's got somebody's signature on it, they'll go ahead and stamp it and monetize it. That's why I don't sign shit for none of these assholes. So, I, unless I'm dealing with the Treasury and I actually sign something like that, that's because I'm paying for something. Other than that, you're not getting my fucking signature. It's not happening. So I also have read extensively, extensively treaties on the legal and financial history of money and banking and have published several articles uh, covering all of the subjects you just mentioned. I have served as an expert witness in several trials, including banking practices and monetary instruments. 
a summary, biographical sketch, and resume uh, a resume, including further details of my work experience. Reading publications and education will be tendered to defendants and may be made available to the courts and to the plaintiff counsel upon request. So, oh damn, I forgot to put the fucking last time down. All right, so, just give me a second. All right, so, relevance of subtle distinctions about types of money. Uh, from my study of historical and economic writings on the subject, I conclude that common misconception about the nature of money, unfortunately, has been perpetuated in the U.S. monetary and banking systems, especially since the 1930s. In classical economic theory, one economic exchange has moved beyond the barter stage. There are two types of money, money of exchange and money of account. So, for ne so money of exchange is going to be something of value for something of value okay so money of account is you're just talking about fucking numbers inside of a computer so for nearly 300 years in both europe and, and the united states confusion about the distinctiveness of these two concepts has led to persistent attempts to treat money of account as the equivalent of money of exchange in reality especially in a fractional reserve bank <laughs> i fucking laugh because the fractional reserve shit is ridiculous. Like, you don't even understand how easy it is to fucking get rich. And I say rich with quotes because that shit is all, <laughs> that shit is all fucking nonsense. So, in reality, especially in fractional reserve banking, okay, where you only really, literally need one tangible object to multiply that shit by 10 uh, times that you can securitize that amount on. It's fucking crazy. So, a uh, uh, comparatively small amount of money of exchange, gold or silver, and officially, Currency notes may support a vastly larger quantity of, and we'll see what this goes to. So what do we got here? So. Hang on a second, let me change my headphones real quick. That shit died on me. So, business transactions. Business transactions uh, denominated in money of account. The sum of these transactions is the sum of credit extension in the economy. With the exception of customary stores of value like gold and silver, the monetary base of the economy largely consists of credit instruments. Against this background, I conclude that the note despite some language about lawful money explained below, clearly contemplates both disbursements of funds and eventual repayment or settlement in money of account. That is money of exchange that would be welcome, but is not required to settle the note. Basically what they're saying is this, is that nobody ever lent you shit. So these people are not in a position to demand any, any, any specific species or form of currency in order to be repaid due to the fact that they never really gave you anything of value only they were just middlemen in a fucking transaction that they had no fucking business in. You know, that you went and invited them into, to be honest with you. So, the factual basis of this conclusion is the reference of, in the reference in the disbursement request and authorization to repayment of $95,905.16 to Michigan National Bank from the proceeds of the note. That was an exchange of credit of, of, uh, of Bank One, the plaintiff, for credit apparently and previously extended to defendant by Michigan National Bank. Also, there is no reason to believe that the plaintiff would refuse a substitution of the credit of another bank or banker as uh, complete payment of the defendant's repayment obligation under the note. Basically what he's saying is this, is that this is that the same way that you could go to another bank and have them repay your debt with nothing, it would just be fucking numbers in the computer that they sent over or a piece of paper Okay, the same way that you can go to another bank and they would fucking accept that shit as repayment is the same way that they're going to fucking accept what you give them as repayment because it's the same fucking thing. Cut it out. So the factual basis of this conclusion. Hang on, I just lost my place. Uh, yeah, so so look, so basically, so what I just said there, they, I mean, so they're going to have to take whatever note that you give them back in order to get that repaid because all that really was uh, entered into was uh, agreements on a different note 
That's all that happened. So, you know, you sign to get in on a note and you sign a note to get out. Really, really simple. Not even that complicated. So the fact of the matter is this, is that if they're going to accept something like that from another bank, then they're going to accept that from you because you are a bank as well. So that was an exchange of credit of bank one plaintiff for credit apparently and previously extended to defendants. Uh, also, there is no reason to believe that the plaintiff would refuse a substitution of the credit of another bank or banker as a complete payment of the defendant's repayment obligation under the note. This is a case about exchanges of money of account, which is credit, not about exchanges of money exchange, which is lawful money or even legal tender. Meaning that there was no literal uh, dollar bills that moved around in that in that in that transaction. Okay, so. So, ironically, the note explicitly refers to repayment in lawful money of the United States of America, right? So they're going to be like, okay, so we're going to go ahead and extend you credit, which they don't even extend you credit. You extend them credit because every loan is really a fucking deposit and they get that from the Treasury Department, keep that shit on the low, and then they'll go ahead and get you to just start paying their taxes on investments that they're going to make using your credit that was just given to them when you gave them your social security number and signed on that dotted line. That's what really happened. So, all right, so they're going to extend you credit now, right? And then they're going to demand you pay them back in green pieces of paper. Yeah, fucking right, bro. So promises to pay clause traditionally and legally, Congress defines the phrase as lawful money. So they're going to demand fucking what? Something else when you didn't, <laughs> when that wasn't even part of the transaction. So you got to be careful what you sign and what, you know what I mean? Be and uh, things like that, because they can trick you easily when you don't know the uh, definitions. So lawful money was the form of money of exchange that the federal government or any state could be required to, um, by statute to receive in payment of taxes or other debts. Traditionally, as defined by Congress, lawful money only included gold, silver, and currency notes redeemable for gold and silver on demand. In a banking law context, lawful money was only the was uh, only those forms of money in exchange, the forms just mentioned, plus U.S. bonds and notes redeemable for gold that constitutes the reserves of the National Bank prior to 1913. Prior to 1913. So the date of creation of the Federal Reserve Banks, uh, lawful money, and so this is out of, uh, what is it, Webster's apparently. So... In light of these facts, I conclude that the plaintiff and defendant exchange reciprocal credits involving money of account and not money of exchange. So this is all, so um, this is a court case right here, you know what I mean? So no lawful money was or probably ever would be dispersed by either side in the covered transactions. So there was no actual, there was no actual money there. So this conclusion also is consistent with the bookkeeping entries that underlie the loan account. And we're going to get into that next gap and, and um, how that works. General accepted fucking accounting practices. Generally accepted doesn't mean. <laughs> and I mean, we're going to get into what the fucking into what these banks are really doing. And I'm going to break this shit down for you so you can see how fucking crazy these motherfuckers are. So moreover, it is puzzling why plaintiff would retain the archaic language lawful money of the United States of America in its otherwise modern seeming note. It is possible that this language is merely a legacy from the pre-1933 era. Modern credit agreements might include repayment language such as the repayment obligation under this agreement shall continue until payment is received in fully and finally collected funds. Certified funds, you can make a money order and all that. It's the same thing. So which avoids the entire question of in what form of money or credit is the repayment of obligation due. And so that's when you want to get into what, what money actually is in court and you want to get into the definition of that because that's going to dictate the outcome of this whole case in general. Uh... And it's going to, you know, it's going to make things real, real clear for them. As if they don't already fucking know. They're just hoping that you don't know. So, it is a game of chess. Stop playing checkers with these clowns. That's what I got for you for now. Until we meet again.